Okay, so good morning, afternoon and evening everyone and welcome to our second session of our third edition of Connex 2023, headlining the team, understanding and treating wooden supports. My name is Vincent Kattersall of the University of Antwerp and I'll be replacing Shane Rivers tonight. And my name is Angelika Rauch of the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam. Hello, can anybody hear me? Yes. Angelica, can you hear us? Hello. Angelica? Yes. Okay. Um, it's up to you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, no start with te technical difficulties, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, so Vincent and, and myself will both be hosting today's session. And uh, before we proceed with our introduction, we want to go through basic rules of conduct. And uh, as you can see here, please make sure that both your microphone and webcam are turned off. And um, we encourage our audience and participants to ask questions, but to do so in the chat box only. And it's our um, moderators in the background who will collect these for the Q&A sessions. And um, for unknown technical reasons, some of the slides show up zoomed in. So if you think that is the case, please use the Zoom function by clicking on the magnifying glass on the upper left corner uh, of the slides. And uh, finally, we want to stress that this is a conference for and by emerging conservators. So please respect one another for their exceptional effort of making this happen. And uh, some of our speakers will be presenting for a large audience for the very first time. So please keep that in mind. Thank you, Angel Angelica. So once again, I welcome you all to the second session of Connex 2023. And for those unaware of the Connex initiative, a short introduction. Connex is a joint effort of the wood, furniture, polychromy and modern material conservation training programs of, and please bear with me, the universities of Antwerp, Amsterdam, Hildesheim, Cologne, Potsdam, Lincoln, Westin, Tomás, Dubrovnik, ENP in Paris and ENSAF at La Cambre in Brussels. As we all know, education is paramount for our future, and it all starts by sharing your hard work, your new insights, experiences and knowledge. And this is where Connext comes into play. It is our mission to provide students and emerging conservators, restorers, a platform where you can share that knowledge and engage with international colleagues. Uh, but uh, before we start, I want to take this opportunity to point out the Connext book of abstracts to you. And this PDF can be read and downloaded by scanning the QR code on the shown slide. And um, the book contains all abstracts of the papers and posters presented at the four sessions of Connext 2023. We will post a direct link in the chat as well. And um, as Vincent um, already mentioned, uh, today's session is about understanding and treating wooden supports, which is a topic that brings us right back to the fundamentals of our specialization. And we therefore invited a keynote speaker who had his fair share of experience with this topic. So please let's welcome Mr. Shane Wishnik from Sydney, Australia. Uh, I want to quickly introduce Shane. Shane studied furniture conservation at West Dean College in England, where he received the British Antique Dealers Association Geoffrey Moss Prize. And after that, he expanded his professional skills by studying Japanese joinery at the Suoikasha International Craft School in Kyoto, as well as cabinet making at TIFE in Lidcombe. He currently works as uh, the principal furniture conservator for studio conservation freelances regularly for national and international institutions, 
teaches woodworking and craft courses at the Sydney Community College. And furthermore, Shane was involved in developing the woodworking program for the environmental charity Bauer Use and Repair Centre in Sydney, Australia. It is an um, initiative that focuses on using reclaimed materials to make durable furniture, furniture repairs and wooden objects for the community. In 2021, Shane obtained uh, the prestigious the George Alexander Foundation uh, Fellowship Grant. And this grant allowed him to travel and spend time in different private conservation studios across the United States and Europe. And the aim of this endeavor, to learn from and to share knowledge with other professionals. His keynote will be about this incredible international experience. Um, and please note that uh, the Q and A uh, session for Shane will be straight after his uh, presentation, as it is 3 a.m. in Australia. So Shane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good. Um, very early in the morning. My name is Shane, and as mentioned, I am a, a furniture conservator restorer based in Sydney, Australia. Last year, as discussed, I um, undertook a, a project inspired largely by the, the traditional journeyman of places like Germany and France, whereby apprentices in a craft would go and, and work with different masters in different workshops uh, in different places and able to, in order to, to gain experience. And um, I decided uh, to grow my own experience. I would go and try and work in different conservation and restoration workshops uh, internationally myself. You can see here uh, a photo of me the day before I left on my trip. This is two days after Australia opened its international borders. And while I had, uh, at this point in time, uh, been planning this trip for over a year, there was still a lot of it I hadn't worked out. Some aspects of it I knew would come as I went along. I didn't know at this point in time that I would end up working, um, traveling for 11 months, working in over 12 workshops. Uh, visiting over 30 different professionals within the field outside of those workshops, and also getting hands-on uh, on over 40 different projects uh, of a variety of, of types over the course of my, my year. I would, of course, get to work on uh, furniture objects of, of all types and varieties in different places, but I would also get to work on agricultural objects as well as uh, architectural objects and get to work on um, interiors uh, like this... Uh, a hand-painted faux uh, walnut staircase in the United States from the Gilt Age, uh, this getting to go under the floor in this uh, historic synagogue in, um, in Amsterdam, and even getting to, to help out for a day on a, a modern fresco at a university in Tel Aviv. It is definitely in the nature of this conference that I am, I am excited to talk to everybody. The, the idea of getting together uh, people from all over um, to share experience and knowledge is really important, and I love it. And so in the nature of this, this uh, conference, I thought I would talk about my own effort in this regard. Here at the top of this outline, you can see the word methodology. Um, but as you may have gathered, this was not the most rigorously academic uh, research project. It was not, in fact, organized by any institution, um, education body. I am not a student at the moment. This was something that uh, was entirely uh, self-motivated, something that I had to organize and decide to do independently, i.e., I, I made it up. Uh, but I would like to talk with everyone today about the, the planning um, and what method I went into to choose workshops and to organize it, um, as well as, of course, the things I learned, but specifically the things I, I was able to learn through this approach and some of the advantages of being able to to learn from different people in different places, and of course discuss um, the value of this trip and uh, whether there is value in this kind of approach or whether I just you know wasted a year of my life. But we'll start with the methodology. So specifically here, when I say methodology, what I want to talk about is um, uh, where I went, but also why I ended up going to those places, some of the reasoning behind it, how I ended up making those arrangements. And I'll talk a little bit about the logistics of how I paid for it and some other logistic elements, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. To start with, though, 
This is the list of workshops I ended up working in last year. I spent three months working in the United States, five weeks in France, five weeks in the Netherlands, another three months in Britain, four weeks in Austria, and three weeks in Israel. Now you will notice immediately there is a bias here towards the um, largely English-speaking countries at the top of the list here. There are um, a couple reasons for this. One of them is because I am uh, an American citizen and Australian permanent resident. And unfortunately, I tried to learn France before traveling the or French, but I mostly speak English. And I knew I did not want to be a burden on the workshops that were taking me in. Um, so I tried to seek workshops that were okay with me as an English speaker. But quite honestly, the biggest motivator for this um, was funding, uh, costing, and also visas. Um, I did a lot of work in advance to try and find visas that would allow me to do this type of trip. I looked into research and, and work visas for this trip, but unfortunately a lot of the work visas that are available require you to work for one employer for the entirety of time in a certain space. And that was not the intention of this trip at all. I wanted to work with a number of people. So for the US, I'm a US citizen, I could spend as long as I wanted there. And then I ended up traveling the rest of my time um, on, on travel visas, essentially. So I could spend 90 days and 180 day period in uh, the EU. And then I had to uh, head over to Britain for three months to hang out until I could go back to the EU um, and spend some more time there before then heading off to Israel and then home. Another thing you might notice when looking at this list is that um, these are all private institutions. There's no um, uh, museums or state organizations in this. It became clear very early on in, in my, my idealization <laughs> for this project that um, institutions, museums didn't really have a mechanism that I was aware of for the type of thing I wanted to do. Uh, there are internships for students. I'm not a student and there are volunteer programs, uh, which didn't give me quite what I was looking for. So I narrowed it down to private um, organizations for the sake of this trip. And I mostly work in private conservation here in Sydney. So that was very appropriate for me. As I mentioned before, um, not everything was in the works when I started. I knew there'd be a certain amount of leeway. And I was planning this trip in 2021, where um, the future was not certain for everybody in many ways. And so there was a lot that needed to be uh, organized as I went. And a few workshops that I had planned to work with didn't actually have anything for me to do in the end. And a few changes needed to be made. You can see here in green, all of the workshops that I had made arrangements with prior to leaving. Um, and these are places that I reached out to through just my, my network that I had, a network of people I'd met while studying like Addison Conservation in Vienna people I, I knew through social media, uh, like Atelier Cabal, and also just reaching out to various professionals that I respected and, and just sending, genuinely just sending an email saying, this is the trip that I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to get. Is it possible that I could spend time with you or do you recommend someone else that I might be able to work with? Then the, um, the remaining workshops shown here in purple are, um, are the ones that I either started communicating with after I left, or in a couple cases, people who reached out to me after they heard about what I did, or in the case of uh, Bryson Strape and uh, Zetland Conservation down at the bottom, those were individuals that I met at the uh, Ebenis conference in Amsterdam in March of that year. I sat down, I, I told them about what I was doing, and I asked them if I'd be able to, to work with them. Um, and thankfully, they said yes. And I'm, I'm genuinely very, thankful to everyone on this list. Everyone here was kind enough to take me in, kind enough to share their time and their knowledge with me. And it was really exceptional to, to be able to spend time with, with everyone here. So I'm very thankful for that. Now it may sound uh, like my methodology was strictly whoever said yes, I went and worked with. And there is a, a certain truth to that but it's not the whole truth necessarily. And I think I, I wanna zoom in on the um, the Britain section of this um, to highlight some of the other theory that went into this. Because you could organize this trip um, with a focus in mind. I, I could have, if I wanted to focus purely on marketry work or ethnographic objects, I could have sought out specifically people in those fields and it would have been an, an, a truly inspiring trip in that way. 
my goal as a, as a conservator based in Australia, whereby um, there aren't that many trained professionals in this country, and a lot of the objects we get, we have local ethnographic things, but we also have pieces made by um, practitioners who studied in different places around the world, and we also get imported a lot of objects from around the world. The, a broad scope was really what I wanted. I wanted to get an experience that, that showcased a broad range of as much as what happens in the field to furniture and wooden objects um, in as many places as I could. So if you see here uh, for the section in Britain, I spent time with uh, H.D. Morris Furniture, a personal friend of mine, but also a, a traditional pre-industrially trained furniture maker. I spent time with uh, Bainbridge Conservation, who Abby and Tristram Bainbridge are both um, museum conservators who previously worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum. I spent a week with Long French Polishing, a, a second generation French polisher who pretty much exclusively just does French polishing, finishing and refinishing of furniture. And I worked with uh, Philip Burroughs Restoration in the Channel Islands, who is a second generation restorer. Uh, his father worked in London in uh, uh, mallets and hat fields to major restoration companies that a lot of the pieces I've seen here in Sydney have previously been worked on in those workshops. And then uh, Philip has worked in Hatfields as well and then gone off to start up his own business. But he had a lot of that experience from those organizations that, that was really invaluable to me to be able to get. And this for me on this project was, was huge. And this will be a theme going forward. The capacity of this project really was variety and the, can, the, the ability to, to see many different approaches and work with many different people. Now, I did only end up working with 13 workshops, and in some countries, only one workshop in that space. So to try and round out that experience, I also tried to make a point of visiting as many uh, other professionals and institutions as possible. This gave me the, the capacity. You can see here the list of, of um, organizations and professionals that I met with along my trip. Uh, this is not just museums that I visited or, or whatnot. That would be a much longer list. Uh, this is this is places where I specifically went and I went into the conservation labs or went into the workshops. I spoke with the people there and I got an opportunity to, to learn from, from them about what they do. This allowed me, for instance, to be able to get a little bit of the international perspective on museum conservation. I got to go into the workshops at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris and the Victoria and Albert Museum, et cetera. But I also got to go see some, some craftspeople like some uh, uh, guitar makers, uh, luthiers in, in France, and some upholsters. And this helped me try to round out my experience in, in each place I went. This also allowed me to visit a couple places that I wasn't able to find work. For instance, uh, I got to visit Malta and visit Heritage Malta and a few other restoration companies there. And I got to spend a couple days in Germany meeting with Heinrich at the um, Bavarian Palace Administration, which was incredible. Um, Talking a little bit about costing, so that's roughly you know, the method behind choosing places. It was trying to get as much, trying to get breadth, um, and also um, people who would say yes to letting me visit them. The, the logistic side of it comes with how, to, how did I pay for it, how did I organize it. Like I said before, a lot of it was email communication. Paying for it was I got some support, thankfully, through the International Specialized Skills Institute, that George Alexander Fellowship. Um, they promote Australians going overseas, and the rest of it was in total uh, just my personal savings that I'd saved up over the previous year. I think I'd put together about 39,000 Australian dollars, translate that to your own currency as you will, um, which in, in Sydney is considered lower than a comfortable annual living wage. Um, so it helped me cover my flights and a lot of the buses that I took around Europe and some of my accommodation, some of my food. But realistically, I relied heavily on support from friends as well as the workshops that I stayed in. Um, a few people hosted me. I stayed with um, uh, some of the neighbors of the Bainbridges house sitting their house. And in one particular instance throughout a lot of my trip in Germany, I borrowed a, uh, well, I acquired a small hatchback that was being thrown away and I took out all the seats to make it my own personal living quarters and uh, travel accommodation for the time I was in Britain, complete with my own faux uh, stained glass window because that window was covered in duct tape when I acquired it. But back to 
the trip and the learnings. So when I want to talk about the learnings here, it was, it was 11 months of intensive time directly in workshops, uh, meeting different people, working hands-on with different things. I cannot possibly, in a short period of time, discuss with you everything that I got out of this experience. Um, so I am going to pick a few elements, and I'm going to pick um, specific examples within them to kind of highlight the, the type of thing that I got to experience and the type of thing that was somewhat unique to this approach, in my opinion. Um, I want to focus a little bit on the, the objects I worked on, some of the materials and techniques that, that I, I saw, and then a little bit about approaches, although not too much about approaches. Starting with objects, though, I guess what I mean in this instance is the, the pieces that I actually worked on. And the example that I want to give here is um, the very first piece I worked. I've tried to choose pieces, um, examples outside of the regions that most of you are probably in, so that you can get a little bit of this experience of, of international exchange. So this piece was a lovely Secretaire uh, Bureau bookcase uh, in Virginia. This uh, was the first piece that I got to work on. When I arrived in Virginia, I was working with um, Carrie Howlett, former head of conservation at, the, at Colonial Williamsburg. And this is a 1770s-ish um, cabinet uh, bookcase secretaire uh, from Virginia, from the southern United States. And there were a few things immediately for me that I, I noticed about this that were interesting. I studied at West Dean. Um, and uh, I got a very English um, training there. And I work in um, Australia now, and a lot of the pieces that I work on here, a lot of the private pieces are, have been imported from England. So I've worked on quite a lot of English pieces in the past. And there are a few things about this that stood out to me as different. 1770s-ish pieces in England, by and large, are often made with mahogany as the primary timber, whereas this is um, American walnut as the primary timber. And then the secondary timber here is a um, is something referred to as yellow pine, which is a, a kind of pine specific to the southern United States around Virginia. It looks to me a lot like Douglas fir, but it, it's a bit harder. You can't put your fingernail in it. It was a, it was a new timber to me that I hadn't worked with before. Um, additionally to that, there were some things in the way it was made that were new to me. It might not be new to all of you. But for me, the, the, the design on the top of the arches, not, while not new, was not common with a lot of the pieces I worked on. And specifically, something that stood out was the, the way these dust boards, the, the boards between the drawers, were, um, were constructed. For similar pieces at um, that time, for what I've worked on, you would often see runners on the side and a, and a board across the front and maybe a panel in the middle, whereby this piece was solid front to back, big chunk of walnut on the front big chunk of yellow pine. Carrie Howlett, who I was working with, is, is an absolute expert in um, southern United States furniture, specifically Virginia furniture. As, as head of conservation at Colonial Williamsburg, this is largely what he has worked on. He was able to explain from his experience that this is very common for that area and for that time, and that this is the way a lot of things were made. In his understanding, there are factors that led to this, such as materials uh, available, um, in terms of an abundance of timber compared with the EU, but also the craftspeople. So there were English craftspeople at the time, but there were also craftspeople who had come from Germany uh, and Austria and other places. And some of those um, crafts had gone into this piece. Now, uh, object history and researching a single piece is not unique. It's not special to this kind of trip. But what was really special to me here was after working on this in Virginia, I then immediately went on to Baltimore and worked in Baltimore, and then I went up to Boston, and I worked in Boston, and I got to witness pieces in those places and work on pieces in those places, and immediately got to see uh, the differences between um, objects made in those places compared to this one. And there was quite a, a bit of a difference in subtle ways. And for me, this tacit uh, gaining of knowledge was really important to really compile it in myself from from personal experience. I learned really well that way, essentially. And I got to carry this piece with me in my head as I went along throughout the rest of my trip. Um, apart from objects themselves, there was also materials and techniques I got to learn about. And and every single workshop I went had had something unique to it. 
if not multiple unique things that I didn't see in other places, materials that they use, tools that they use, shop layouts, all of this was extremely valuable. And so again, I have to choose a, a very specific example for the sake of time. Um, and, and when I talk about materials, I, I am talking about the materials that were used in different workshops in different places. As I mentioned before, the pieces I worked on were, were made from different materials, but the choices of materials used in different workshops also had a huge variety. Um, different finishes, different cleaning agents, et cetera, et cetera. The one I want to focus on specifically here is um, Freddie Roman, uh, who was in Boston. And I want to specifically talk about protein adhesives because protein glues were used pretty much in every workshop I visited um, to some regard, whether it was uh, fish glues or hide glues or uh, there was a, a guy who used specifically parchment size for gilding and other places used rabbit skin glues or egg uh, albumin, um, et cetera, et cetera. And in every single one of those, I could pick out a point about something that that person told me about the way that they work that was really unique. But I'm going to use Freddie here as, as my key example. Freddie is a uh, uh, traditionally trained uh, maker. He's trained in pre-industrial furniture making in America specifically. Um, he didn't made a lot of reproduction furniture. He also does some restoration and architectural restoration. Freddie here is demonstrating for me on the left um, how he uh, hammer veneers, applying veneer to this empire base with hot hide glue and force. Um, and on the right, you can see the final product we worked on together. Um, when Freddie uses hide glue, one of the things that he spoke about specifically to me in his use that I didn't hear in other places was that he uh, uses specific gram strengths of hide glue for different things. He, in the United States, buys his hide glue from a very specific supplier, and that supplier sells the hide glue by gram strength or bloom strength, which essentially equates, if you're not familiar, to the um, molecular weight of the proteins. Lower gram strengths like 50 are what's used on like paper and stamps and stuff. Whereas Freddie uses a range of about 190, 240, and 300 for different purposes. And he explained to me his reason and logic behind using these materials. And for the veneering here, he makes sure he uses about a 190 gram strength um, hide glue because its properties, um, essentially it's got a, a longer gelling time, so he has more time to work on it. And he doesn't need with the veneering, according to him, uh, something with more cohesive strength, like a higher molecular weight hide glue would have, uh, because it's a very thin uh, glued surface. For joinery, he then jumps up to 240 for uh, greater cohesive strength and toughness, but still some, some open time that he can work with. And then on some pieces, like a bit of broken carving um, on a mirror that's snapped off, he might use something more like 300 or 400 gram strength, common with uh, luthier usage um, because it's got a greater cohesive strength um, and he doesn't need as long of a glue, uh, clamping time with it. This is not to say I'm recommending to everyone this approach um, or that this is dead fact. I am telling you this because this was what Freddie explained to me came from his training and his use and this is what he does and other people he know, knows does in this particular region uh, that I travel to. And this kind of highlights a little bit uh, of, of the difference in approaches. In different places and even within different workshops in different places, there was quite a variety of approach. And it was really interesting to me to see that variety. I don't want to go into it too much, but it was, in my opinion, really fantastic to get that experience of variety, even if I don't necessarily agree with everything that was done. Um, that wasn't really the goal of this trip. But there was a range of approaches that different people had to different things. And being able to see that and experience that firsthand was, was really illuminating. For instance, on the right here, this is the French polisher that I spent a week with in the UK. He exclusively pretty much French polishes from scratch, refinishing pieces. And on the left, you have a um, mid-century um, piece with a nitrocellulose coating that was deteriorating and delaminating from the surface. And so the attempt here was to use a solvent mixture to resaturate the existing nitrocellulose coating so as not to remove any original material. There was quite a broad scope of approaches and to 
the different workshops and within places that I visited, which for me was really valuable. And I think for that sake, I should jump immediately into value. In my opinion, the, the main point of this trip, as I said before, was to get to go places and get to see the, the differences uh, in terms of how people do things, what skills they have, what knowledge they have, what types of objects they work on, not only because I might try and implement those myself, but also to, to know what's being done by other people and what has been done by other people to objects. When I look at things now, I can read them with a little bit more information about um, particularly some of the stuff that's come from uh, mallets or uh, the UK, and I can understand a little bit more what was done to them in the past. And being able to experience that firsthand, to get hands-on experience with all of this variety of objects um, and all of these perspectives was was completely invaluable to me. It was it was amazing. Of course, there's the the professional network that I was able to develop through this. All of those people I worked with and met along the way, I still talk to. Uh, almost all of them regularly um, asking them for advice or when I'm traveling, whether I can meet up with them again. And then there's um, the thing I kind of really want to talk with everyone about, which is the life lessons aspect of this. Um, you are all students for the most part, and I am still very early career in, in my life. And I have always been curious about how other people work. And this was a really excellent opportunity for me uh, secretly to see how other people live and how other people work, how they organize their day, how they speak with clients, how they manage jobs and time and life. Um, Freddie, who I spoke about earlier, he, he at the time was working six days a week, 10 hours a day, and he was not happy about it. Whereas other places I worked, we sat down for long lunches, people talked about their hobbies on the weekend. It, it really was almost as valuable to me to be able to sit down with people and experience their day-to-day -day life in different settings as it was to learn about how they approach furniture objects along the way. So I'm very thankful to, to everyone that I got to meet and this experience is one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Um, and I really hope that I get to meet and work with more people in the future. Thank you all for, um, for your time and for listening to me talk about my very extended holiday. Um, and that is, that is it for me. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shane. And uh, what an amazing experience that must have been. Um, as mentioned before, we will jump immediately to the questions for you. So the first question that we have is, how much time did it take you to settle into a workshop? Um, how much time did it take me to settle into a workshop? Great question. As the trip went on, less and less time. So the first place I went to uh, in Virginia, I was very nervous. I was very unsure. I was very, um, it took me quite a while to really get comfortable in that setting, even though I was working um, alongside someone I knew already. But by the end of the trip, I was um, I was dropping into workshops with a much greater ease. There was a point in my trip where every day I was somewhere new, and so at a certain point, I got a lot more comfortable with um, with dropping in somewhere and and picking things up, and also knowing what questions to ask as I went along, which was which was really valuable. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that we have, and I think it's the final question before we leave you, is what would you recommend out of your experiences for the students if they are planning a similar trip? Oh, save up more money uh, would be a big one. Mm -hmm. um, but do I, one of the pieces of advice that was given to me by a um, someone who works at Fine Woodworking in the United States was to, to be the dumb person in the room and be okay with that. Um, so when you, when you go and work in the new workshops, be completely okay with, with bringing none of your own experience to it, just dropping in and saying, okay, how do you do this? I know nothing. Tell me the way that you do things. And I found that I got a lot out of every single place by, by basically playing idiot, which I kind of am 
in every single place that I went. So be really open to experiences and opportunities and, and do leave some time um, to, to go and pursue things that you discover along the way. It was really important. Also, separately, um, every, every single institute, uh, like museum, that I emailed and said, hey, I'm traveling, I'm doing this thing, can I come and meet you and go to your conservation lab? Every single one of them said yes. <laughs> Wow. And it, I didn't realize that was something that you can do. But as people in this field, uh, there is a lot of openness to, to being able to visit. And there are a lot of people out there who would be keen to, to meet up with you. So take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's really great to know. Um, so I believe these are all the questions we have for you, Shane. So once again, thank you for this nightly effort. And please get some well-deserved sleep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ciao. So let's go back to our presenters. First off is Marta Mandic. Marta is a second year master's student at the University of Dubrovnik, where she gained practical experience with a variety of objects. Among those, a wall clock, a Biedermeier oval table from the Croatian Academy of Art collection, and a casting mold used for Dubrovnik 17th century bell tower clock preserved at the Dubrovnik Museum. Currently, Marta is working on an 18th century cantilever mirror from the summer villa Kucetic Kotze at the Tresteno Arboretum near Dubrovnik. And this is the topic she will be covering today. So Marta, please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, my presentation is about conservation and restoration of an overpainted 18th century neoclassical cantilever mirror frame. <clears throat> the oh, cantilever mirror frame is just one of the few items from the summer house uh, Gucic uh, Cosa, and it's uh, an arboretum that is in Testeno, and it's uh, right now under the ownership of the Croatian Academy of Science and Arts that is currently working with the University of Dubrovnik. The summer house Kucetic, uh, summer house Kucetic, built in the 6th century, and with it also the chapel of Saint Chesmo, the uh, aqueducts, mills, uh, and economical building. Uh, the summer house went through a lot, you could say, <clears throat> as it was affected by the first uh, world war and the second by the earthquake in 1667 uh, and also by the homeland wars in ex-Yugoslavia. The last owner of the summer house uh, at the Arboretum and he died in 1950. And today the Arboretum and the summer house are sponsored and owned by the Croatian Academy of Science and Arts. <clears throat> So the neoclassical uh, mirror frame from the 18th century is rectangular shape, and the base wood, uh, wood is caniculus wood. Uh, also, we can see from the architectural elements the neoclassical style inspiration. It also uh, has a lot of uh, profile elements and the veneers that are made from walnut. Except that uh, it has gilded ornaments in uh, different styles as rosettas, uh, garlands, uh, beads, and similar. And it came, of course, with an original mirror that we suspected to be amalgam. Uh, the mirror wasn't really kept in good conditions uh, as it was kept in the summer house, which uh, didn't have good conditions in temperatures rising up and down and uh, humidity. Uh, so it was really affected by it, but except that <clears throat> it uh, was overpainted by a dark color that we from the get-go saw that it's not the original color that it should be. The damages were mechanical and biological. Mechanical in a sense uh, that a lot of ornaments were missing uh, and broken off. Uh, and also the gilding base, uh, as we can see here, but in a photo that we took under the dim light was worn off and the gold leaves were missing uh, on certain parts. 
when it comes to biological damage, uh, there is a lot of insect exit tunnels uh, visible all throughout the object. Uh, and they basically, uh, the structure of the surface was um, not stable enough to, uh, to, to work on it. So, work on it, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and before the conservation treatment, conservation and restoration treatment, some in investigations were done. We took three samples, one from uh, the mirror as the amalgam metal sheet. Uh, the other one was a uh, one that was took uh, of the glaze that is underneath the overpaint. And C1 was took from the ornaments so we could see what is the composition of the ornament. Uh, the results uh, basically confirmed our suspicions. In the A1, uh, the sample that was uh, taken from the mirror uh, consists of uh, tin, so it is a tin mercury amalgam mirror. The C1 uh, confirmed to us <clears throat> that it's in fact uh, some kind of gypsum. And L1 uh, also gave us an insight of what the glaze contains from protein and the ribbons that can be connected with the ochre pigment, red pigment, and hematite or hematite. <clears throat> when we did the investigation, uh, we started the restoration treatment. The first one was, of course, to document the condition the object was found in, then consolidation, cleaning of the object, under gluing of the ornaments and the veneers, cleaning the gilded ornaments, cleaning of the metal parts, making of the molds for the reconstruction of the ornaments, reconstruction of the ornaments in plaster, reconstruction of the missing wooden parts, <clears throat> reconstruction of the missing wooden ornaments, uh, consolidation of tin mercury amalgam mirror. Uh, consolidation we needed to do first. As I said, the structure of the wood, especially on the surface, was affected by the insects. So uh, we injected ferroloid B72 uh, directly into the exit holes of the insects to till we, start, till we uh, stabilize the surface and the ornaments as well. Uh, after that, the cleaning um, of the object began. Uh, the front side, uh, while we were consolidating the object, we noticed that the, the overpaint was thick but also very fragile and it was easily removed by a mechanical approach. So we removed it with the medical scalpel. While the back side of the mirror frame, we tested uh, the pH values and the average was around uh, 6. So we made a buffer solution with a value of 5.5 pH and it uh, cleaned the back, back side of the uh, frame quite well. Of course, I didn't mention, but of course, we did the dry cleaning before all the rest of the cleaning of the object. And this is the view of the object's front side. Uh, halfway through the cleaning. So then uh, we did the undergluing of the ornaments and the veneers. The thick walnut veneer uh, started to, it, it was delaminating from the surface, so we needed to uh, re glue it and underglue it, and we did so with the PVA glue, and we stabilized it using clamps. The ornaments under gluing was the same, uh, just with smaller weights, and we used animal glue in this case. For the cleaning of the gilded ornaments, uh, we used a DA uh, gel, uh, <clears throat> which is put directly onto the ornaments and left to be active for around two minutes after which it was removed uh, with a dry tampon 
and then uh, it was uh, again cleaned with acetone and at the end it was stabilized with shell salt there. And you can see here the before and after pictures of the ornament. The cleaning of the metal part was done with using a um, micro engine uh, for uh, removing of the corrosion that was on the metal part. And after that, we coated it with uh, tannin and uh, Paraloid B72 5% uh, for extra protect protection. Sorry for the wait. <laughs> making of the molds, uh, making making of the molds for the reconstruction of the ornaments. Uh, as we can see, a lot of the ornaments were missing, broken off and similar, but we were lucky enough that we actually had uh, the original uh, ornaments still alive, so we can actually be as truthful to the original uh, because we had them on the, on the frame. We took uh, two approaches while uh, doing the molds. One of them was uh, uh, the two. One of them was uh, the two component silicon elastomer, uh, which we poured directly onto the um, ornaments. While the other one was again a two component uh, mixture that is commercially known as Beta Plus, but we used it only on the one uh, ornament. Uh, as it allowed us to work against gravity, so we could took the print of that one too easily. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Reconstruction of the ornaments in plaster. We poured the plaster into the mold. Um, after which they were after they were dried, uh, we would modify them as as it was needed to fit to the original. Uh, after it, we would glue them to the frame with 40% animal glue, and if needed, it would be again modified with sandpaper, tritely, or with a light gesso. For the reconstruction of the missing wooden parts and staining, we were missing two cubes uh, at the frame, and we decided to use beech wood, and we glued them down with uh, PVA glue, using clamps again for stabilization while the glue uh, dries out. And for the staining of wood, uh, we had to be, we had to stain it to look as much as the original as we could. Uh, so we used uh, Schwinken staining uh, colors, and the color of uh, deep walnut, 163, and the color of, uh, and the tone of brown mahogany, 167. I'm sorry, can you see the slides? To me, it's not showing. I'm so sorry. We can see the slides, Mata. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, sorry. <laughs> uh, and the color, so uh, we mixed two colors, uh, two stains, 163 and 167, to get the desired tone that we wanted. For the reconstruction of the missing wooden ornament, uh, this is also the only wooden ornament that was on the frame. We decided to use a two component putty araldite, uh, as even though we, uh, we did uh, use the um, Araloid B72 for consolidation of the wooden base, it was still not stable enough for us to actually carve on it uh, or put any too much pressure to it. So, this was the best. Uh, 
this was the best decision for us at the time. And the consolidation of tin mercury amalgam mirror. So first, uh, we separated the mirror from the frame, and we were left with two layers: uh, uh, the layer of isolation and the flakes underneath. The layer uh, at the layer of isolation was made of wood fibers that we separated from the flakes. And after that, uh, the cleaning of the flakes began. We used a soft bristle brush to clean as much as we could without losing the flakes or uh, any parts of the mirror. And uh, at the end, the consolidation was done by using the Japanese paper cut into small pieces. Uh, and it was placed onto the flakes. Uh, after which it was sprayed uh, with paraloid B32, uh, and if needed, it was uh, patted onto or over over painted with uh, a brush softly. We then put a polyester film uh, on top of it and wait for better impregnation of the consolidant. And uh, and at the end, uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done on this uh, object, uh, from the gilding base to uh, the replacement of the golden leaves to technician on others. The main question is what will happen with the cantilever mirror when it's restored and uh, when the restore and conservation process is finished. We are hoping that uh, Christian uh, Academy of Science and Art will finish the project that they started at the summer house Gucci uh, And the idea is to make an interior uh, design, a uh, cave style, to represent and show the public um, what uh, what the interior looked like when uh, there were lords uh, in Dubrovnik uh, and nobles in Dubrovnik. So we hope for that, and if uh, not right away, then we just hope that the mirror will be placed in a, under what the right conditions. And that will be all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much uh, for this contribution, Marta. It was very interesting. Uh, we will monitor and collect the questions um, uh, that were put in the chat uh, for our Q&A session, and um, we will have that after the next talk. Uh, so let's continue straight away with our next paper, which will be presented by Desiree Kosel. Desiree is a student at the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam, and uh, she did an apprenticeship in cabinet making while also completing two internships in France and Italy, which made her become interested in working as a conservator restorer. Uh, Dizzy um, did a pre-study internship at the Museum of Applied Arts in Berlin for one year. And um, she currently studies for a bachelor's degree in conservation and restoration of wooden objects. And uh, today she will present a study project she's uh, currently working on quite interesting uh, tale of the very severe restoration problem. And um, her presentation has the title Under Pressure, Applying Vacuum Pressing for the Restoration of a Baroque Tabletop Split in Two and Warped. The floor is yours, Desiree. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for introducing me and I would like to say hello to all the participants and thank the organizers for the opportunity of presenting here tonight. As part of my studies, I carried out the conservation and restoration of a table from the Baroque period. 
The owner is the Museumslandschaft Hessen Kassel, where the table was stored in a depot of the Wilhelmsthal Palace before it came to Potsdam for its restoration. It was constructed in the Baroque style and probably made between 1690 to 1710. In my presentation, I would like to focus on illustrating and evaluating the possibilities and limitations of the vacuum pressing method using the table as an example. First, I want to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. I start with a short description of the object and its previous condition. I will explain the selection of the vacuum pressing treatment based on the conservation and restoration aims and the process of the vacuum pressing. I finish my presentation with a conclusion and provide an outlook. The table consists of a substructure containing a cross piece connecting the hexagonal and conical pillars that stand on four turned feet. The pillars carry a square frame that contains a drawer with a turned knob in the center. The frames in the top substrate is mostly made of pine and veneered with walnut. The veneer on the tabletop shows a ribbon decor of different timbers. At first glance, you immediately notice that the tabletop is broken in the middle as you can see on figure three, and then uh, and that one foot is missing. Before the restoration, the tabletop was detached from the frame and split into two separate parts. Due to climate fluctuations, both parts were deformed and bowed. At the breaking edge of both parts, veneer sections were missing and there was some remnants of animal glue as you can see in the, the ultraviolet light on figure six. I deduced that someone had previously attempted to re-glue the parts of the tabletop. The table showed evidence of various restoration treatments, including veneer additions and relinings. The coating consisting of H. Jellac had also been repolished in the past. Several reasons probably led to the extensive damage. Firstly, the veneer was only applied to one side of the tabletop. In addition, glue residues on the underside indicate that the top was glued to the frame, which meant that the top was not able to freely shrink or swell. Another reason why the tabletop was so badly affected are the conditions at the Wilhelmsthal Palace. The object was exposed to seasonal climatic fluctuations in the depot. And finally, the veneered pine substrate split in two due to internal stresses. At a later stage, the tabletop was only fixed with uh, metal brackets, um, as you can see on figure eight in the red, red circle. The barrack table is planned to be stored in a Löwenburg depot in Kassel and potentially exhibited in future exhibitions. The interior of the pseudo medieval castle, you can see in the background, is modeled after the interior of barrack pleasure places, palaces and country residences. The goal is to restore the historical value of the table and make it accessible to visitors. This includes both conserving the signs of aging and restoring the furniture's original functionality, as well as creating a harmonious aesthetic appearance. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the vacuum pressing process was already carried out in a previous study project at the University of Applied Science in Potsdam. The two students applied the vacuum pressing method successfully to straighten a circular tabletop of a dining table from the Biedermeier period made of oak and we need with cherry wood. This method was originally developed by Gerd van Gaven at the University of Amsterdam. <clears throat> he straightened a door of a Dutch cabinet from the 7th century made of oak and veneered with olive wood. According to van Gaven, bending of veneered oak across the grain is possible by um, raising the moisture content of the wood to 10 to 50% and simultaneously increasing the temperature to 70 degrees at uh, this point of the graph. 
um, the graph showing the elastic regions and felge points with, uh, with changes in relative humidity. A higher wood moisture content causes the cell lumina to expand, resulting in decreased bending strain. At the same time, the glass transition temperature of lignin, uh, which is responsible for the compressive strength and stability of the cell wall in wood, decreases in an increase in temperature. The glass transition temperature of lignin reduces from 200 degrees at a wood moisture content of 0% to 70 degrees at the wood moisture content of 10 to 50 percent. These values may slightly vary depending on the type of wood. This allows the cellulose fibers to slide over each other under pressure, resulting in the straightening of the tabletop. While in previous executions, this technique were the substrate was oak, in this case, softwood veneer is straightened. So therefore, the question arose whether the parameters of the tabletop of the barrack table can be applied. Furthermore, the method also carries risks such as damage to the resonance coating and the risk of mold when the panel is moistured. After consultation with the professors of the University of Applied Science in the museum's officials, the method was carried out according to Van Gerwen's uh, specifications. So firstly, the moisture content of both panel parts had to be increased. For this purpose, the two parts were placed in a climate chamber and stored for several weeks um, at a relative humidity of 70 to 80 percent using a saturated salt solution. After a short time, the moisture in the chamber had already caused both panel parts to straighten. In the next step, I decided to re-glue the two panel parts using carbon fiber dowels as connecting elements for additional stabilization. At the same time, a sample panel was used to simulate the damages of the original panel and to test the parameters of the vacuum pressing process. Um, after the reassembly of the table uh, top parts, I observed that the tabletop had warped again over a short period of time and without climate control. So I put the top back into the climate chamber for several months to increase the wood moisture content again. Meanwhile, I carried out the vacuum pressing method using a sample. The sample plate was heated directly before and during the pressing process in a vacuum system. The temperature that could be applied was limit, limited by the compat compatibilities of other materials used on the original tabletop, such as animal glue and the surface coating made of shellac. Um, I did not want to deteriorate these materials in the heating process. Animal glue is said to start deteriorating at 60 degrees, so I did not want to surpass that temperature in the glue layer between the substrate and the veneer. The tests on the sample plate showed that a persflex sheet covered with silicone coated Melinex film prevent the coating from being damaged. To apply pressure, the high flow industrial system vacuum pump from vacuum pressing systems was used with a pressure of 80 kilopascals. The plastic vacuum bag used for this process had the additional advantage to preventing moisture evaporation. For heating, I used infrared lamps mounted above the vacuum press. After the vacuum pressing experiment was successfully completed, um, completed, I decided to straighten the tabletop under the same conditions. In tests, the surface coating proved to be not uh, sensitive to temperatures of 60 degrees and above. Based on these results, I set the acceptable temperature limit at 55 degrees for the veneered side. I applied heat from the unveneered, uh, unveneered uh, reverse side up to 70 degrees and ensured that the temperature on the veneered side did not exceed 55 degrees. I measured these using infrared and laser thermo thermo <clears throat> thermometers as well as temperature sensors. The pressure was kept stable for about two hours, and during the entire time, the, camp the temperature on both sides was uh, monitored and adjusted. 
after two hours, uh, the top was cooled under constant pressure for half an hour before it was removed from the plastic bag and clamped flat for further cooling and drying. Since the vacuum pressing process earlier this year, the top has gradually dried in a relative humidity of 50% and has been lightly clamped with the help of coals, allowing it to shrink. A week after the pressing process, all clamps were briefly removed and the top appeared to be completely straight. Furthermore, the coating was not damaged. Um, due to the relatively high temperature the vacuum bag, in the vacuum bag, the shellac was slightly heated and it's a bit more shiny in some areas than before. A positive side effect is that by heating the top, the animal glue was softened it and partially we adhered loose veneer. For further restoration measures, the top was removed from the climate chamber and the clamps were temporarily removed. Um, two months later, all clamps were removed once more for a further check. <clears throat> um, the top now shows a slight uh, curvature, you can see here, but uh, which is acceptable. In future, it will, be, uh, it will need to be observed whether the top will continue to warp. It has to be discussed whether a counterpool material is required, which can contribute to a long-lasting straightening effect. The next step involves devising a method for securely attaching the plate to the frame. Potential solutions include uh, using brackets or groove blocks to permit some degree of movement, thereby minimizing the risk of internal stresses. Engaging with, the <clears throat> engaging with the vacuum method has provided me with valuable insights. Wood is a dynamic material and theoretical predictions often differ from practical results. In this particular case, the adjustment of the climate conditions has yielded an initial positive result. It was possible to successfully reassemble and straighten the fragmented sections of the plate. The method showed that pine wood is less suitable for plasticizing than oak. Nevertheless, the example from Amsterdam and Potsdam have shown satisfactory results lasting a long period of time. Ultimately, it is a combination of several factors that result in wood retaining its sharp after straightening. Gross density, fiber direction, and general bending straight can all have an impact on the outcome. Vacuum pressing also has its limitations since the properties of the wood remain unchanged and cannot be altered. The limits of the vacuum begin where the properties of the wood cannot be overcome. Yes, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I was able to give you a small impression of the work that I carried out. And if you have any questions, feel free to write them into the chat. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very fascinating restoration effort, Desiree. So we arrived at the next Q&A session. Let me... Okay. Um, so let's start with a few uh, questions for Marta. Marta, could you please unmute your microphone? Yes, sir. Marta, could you please unmute your microphone? Yes, sir. Hi. So um, I have Hello. a first question for you from the audience, from uh, Velmut Krepp. Um, she asks, what is a BA gel? Uh, it is a gel that is used for removing a slug metal that was on the ornament. So it uh, consists of benzyl alcohol, uh, acetone, uh, ethanol, um, carbophore, uh, sorry, uh, Ectomen C25 and distillated water. Okay, thank you. And so the next question that we have is, I think, from one of the moderators. Um, she questions, did you also consider carving the missing wooden ornaments instead of using epoxy? Yes, yes, uh, yes, but uh, we did consider that we did uh, use 
so to stabilize the wooden base, but it wasn't stable enough. And if we tried, it would only break off. And in this way, we used iron light as it was easier for us to uh, uh, make uh, the form that we wanted to make. And also, it's uh, reversible. You can easily remove it if uh, some better approach is we think of, or in the future someone has a better idea than we did. Okay, um, let me see. Maybe just one more question. Um, I got one from uh, Aspasia Kopsida, also from the audience. Um, she asks, which properties of the PVA glue lead you to pick this adhesive above uh, protein glue? Uh, well, uh, it has stronger adhesion and it's less sens sensitive to climate changes, as in a way that the mirror frame it, it is going to be put back into the villa and uh, we didn't want to, the glue, we needed a stronger adhesion and less sensitive glue as the veneer also would stick. So I I guess that is my answer. <laughs> I hope it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, sounds reasonable. Um, so let's move on to the questions for Desiree. Angelica? Uh, yes, thank you very much. And um, uh, there were some questions for Desiree, but um, they are gone from my sheet, so I try to find them again <laughs> in um, in the chat. Uh, Desiree, if you could uh, unmute your microphone, please. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. There was uh, there's one question here in the chat uh, by Michael Vermart. Uh, if you could redo your restoration, what would you do differently? And did the application of the treatment and the second time you performed it um, leave irreversible, unexpected results? Um, yes. Uh, so if I do the vacuum pressing method again, um, uh, I'm yeah, maybe I um, uh, I would uh, do the reassemble of the tabletop parts after the vacuum pressing um, because I'm not sure if it changed uh, anything or um, but I, I have the I think that um, maybe um, because of the reassemble before the vacuum pressing there are more internal stresses for the parts um, so um, maybe if I just um, yeah um, um, do the vacuum pressing on both parts on both separate parts first and then reassemble them to the tabletop um, I don't have these uh, another internal stresses again so maybe that uh, is one thing I would like to, or I changed for the next time. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Aspasia uh, Kopsida uh, is asking, would you think that this vacuum technique could be applied on a painted wooden surface without um, interference with the paint and varnish layers? Hmm, it's uh, a good question. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. So, um, <laughs> so um, the coating on uh, my uh, on the tabletop was uh, shellac, and it's not that. Um, um, I don't know how to say. <laughs> Maybe I can open up to the floor. Uh, but um, the a painted sur a wooden surface is much more um, f like a fracture. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think what uh, uh, what you mean is that mm. uh, it depends on the melting point of the different components yes. of the mm -hmm. of the paint. I guess um, you know you you mentioned um, the melting point of shellac and that you considered this very carefully, and mm. I think that would be the factor that um, I could imagine would be the most important <laughs> one in, in this question. Um, yes. Um, 
Uh, one last question before we uh, have our well-deserved break uh, by Antje Sigalski. Would, uh, she would like to know if you bought the carbon fiber dowels as uh, ready-made products, um, as rods, or whether you produce them on your own. Um, yes, um, we have that in our workshop as roads, um, and then uh, I cut them uh, for my individual um, length. Um, so uh, yes, you can bore them as uh, rods and cut them with a with a saw. Or yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, um, and uh, also thank you to uh, Marta. And thank you all for the very interesting question. There are more questions in the chat and we'll, um, um, I think there's an opportunity to kind of answer them during the break or um, we email them to, um, uh, to um, our uh, speakers. Um, I think now it's time to have a little break of 10 minutes and um, yeah, see you back in 10 minutes. Bye.
So welcome back, everyone. Um, let's start with our next two speakers after the break. Um, both speakers are from the Instituto Politecnico of Tomar in Portugal. And the first one is Mafalda Maria. Mafalda concluded her conservation and restoration degree in 2021 and is currently doing a master in conservation and restoration of polychrome wooden sculpture. Since 2020, she's been collaborating in multidisciplinary teams of municipalities and private companies for the conservation and restoration of building heritage, mobile heritage objects, such as sculptures, retables, murals, and paintings. Now, some of you might remember Mafalda as a speaker at Connex 2022, where she presented her research related to the applicability of 3D printing in sculpture or from her presentation at the Ibero-American Congress of Research in Conservation and Restoration, where she presented the topic, Preventive Conservation of Sculpture Inserted in Wooden in, in Urban Environment. Um, Mafalda, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Just checking if you can hear me. Yes, we hear you fine. Yes, we hear you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm guessing you can see the, the first slide um, and my presentation is entitled Lost Compensation, a Material um, Compensation uh, Study for Volumetric Reconstruction. That means that throughout this presentation I will talk about the issue of lost compensation as a way to int introduce the topic so that afterwards I can tell you about the exercise of volumetric reconstruction that was done during the classes of the master's degree in conservation and restoration at Institute Polytechnic de Tomar. Finally, I will compare the results obtained in this exercise. So what is lost compensation? It's nothing more than the filling of a volumetric gap, which should not be performed if we do not know how it was originally. That is, not creating new forms, just replicating what we know that was once there. This issue has long been subject of discussion among conservators, since the replacement of a volume may change the appearance of a, an artwork. And in some cases, will this change be positive? Especially in the case of sculptures or any other works of art that are exposed to religious worship, the lack of a certain element in the image may cause strangeness to the target audience, but on the other hand, the introduction of a new volume may cause the same effect. For example, in the first image, the lid of an air um, gap is in the sculpture is missing, and in the second one, the eyes and the ends are not there, and for the third one, there is a large amount of volumetric losses. Each one of them causes different, different reactions and therefore might need different approaches, techniques and materials. In these cases where we conservators are faced with volumetric losses, several questions arise. How do we produce that volume? How do we adhere it to the artwork? artwork? Will this new volume be compatible in material terms and can we make it reversible? Is it really necessary? It is it within the budget of our client? How will the artwork look afterwards? Therefore, to explore some of the options available uh, in the classes of the master's degree, um, we, we, an exercise was carried out and supposing that this heart disappeared and it was necessary to reproduce it, knowing its shapes and dimensions through photographs, how could we do it? The materials chosen were balsa wood, balsit, paper pulp, milliput, and PLEA to make a 3D print. Balsa wood is very light, soft, and allows to be really easily worked with a scalpel or even sandpaper. Balsit is a two-component putty with low density, which means that it can be applied in the innermost areas of the wor woodworks without compromising its natural movement. And once dry, it can also be easily worked with the same tools as balsa wood. However, in order to form volumes, it's necessary to join the two components and wait a few hours for them to begin to harden so that the shapes can be molded. The paper pulp is quite easy to make, especially if already brings the adhesive um, and being only necessary to, to add water to the required consistency. After drying, it's also really easy to work with and has better drying time than balsit. Milliput is also a two component epoxy. However, unlike balsit, it's not low density, which means that it can, on, it can only be used in end zones, such as, for example, fingers or noses. 
as placing it in the innermost areas of the artwork will obstruct, obstruct its natural movements and therefore cause damage. After it's dried, it becomes really hard and much more difficult to model. Um, these are, apart from the wood identical to the original, the most used, maybe the most used materials for volume replacement. However, to experiment some new materials, it was also used PLEA for a 3D print, print model. Um, this was the first time I've worked with any of these materials, and so there were some difficulties. In the first four options, the struggles uh, experience were more related to the modeling of the materials as they all work in different ways. However, and I'll, although I really enjoy exploring these newer options, the one that presented the most difficulties was the 3D printing. Obtaining this object encompassed learning how to work with the modeling program and with the program that sends the information of the model to the, to the 3D printer. The learning process of these technologies uh, shown to be much slower than the learning process of the modeling of the first ones. So here you can see the final results of each of the objects in the different materials. The one that I personally think that end up resembling more the original one, it's the balsa one. And where the biggest differences between the original and the models are found is in the crown. That is in the most detailed part. The heart made of paper pulp was the most complicated to obtain good details with since the grains of paper were really rough and not allowing a good finish. However, this factor can vary from brand to brand. The 3D printed heart faithfully reproduced the shapes of the model in the Photoshop. The problem was more related with the production of the model because since it was my first time that I've worked with the program, there were some still some features that I did not master very well. However, the level of detail is 100% faithful to the introduced in the program. Making a more direct comparison of the materials, the best complexity of the shapes has to be attributed to PLEA since the print looks exactly as it looked in the virtual model. Regarding the easiness of use, the paper paste pulp is the simplest and easiest one to use, so much so that Sometimes it's used in kindergartens to make crafts with the children. Um, as far as drying time is concerned, balsa wood and PLEA do not have it. Um, and it's true that PLEA needs time to be printed, but that time it's not consumed by the conservator as he can be performing another task, task while he's being printed. For the price, paper pulp is again the winner as it's the most affordable one. And finally, for the weight, of each piece, balsa wood is the lightest one. However, and comparing again with the printed one, it can pr be printed hollow or with much less infill, which results in a much lighter um, object. Finally, I just wanted to point out that there are no universal options and that what works for one situation may not work for another. And even in the same art, artwork, what's good in one volumetric gap may no longer be right for another. Therefore, being always necessary to keep in mind the issues listed at the beginning and um, making conscious and informed ethical uh, and material choices. I hope that with this presentation, I've uh, made you aware of the differences between one, each one of these options. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mathilda. This was a very interesting presentation. And um, again, we will gather any questions for the Q&A session after the final talk. And um, our final talk is from Anna Fonseca. Anna initially graduated in interior design and communication design and is currently enrolled as a master's student in conservation and restoration of sculpture at the Instituto Politecnico di Tomar. And since 2017, she has been collaborating in conservation and restoration projects in the Museum of Christus in Suzel. Please go ahead, Anna. Okay, uh, you can see, you can, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you, okay. you can see your slides, <laughs> everything's okay. Okay. 
Uh, good afternoon. First uh, of all, I would like to thank for this opportunity to show the, the project, the project uh, Pedagogical Sweet Case for Wood Sculpture. Um, okay. Uh, the uh, pedag pedagogical suitcase project came up in the subject of project in the degree on, on conservation and restoration of the Institute Polytechnic tomorrow. So about the, the professor Ana Bidar with the, the aim to include the educational uh, service in the Christ, is, um, Christ Museum in Sozel. Uh, the Christ uh, Museum open uh, to the public uh, in 2019. It's a new museum uh, that received very frequently students from the primary schools uh, of the administrative districts. Uh, this is a way to connect the children to the museum and to present them the, the culture and the heritage. Uh, this is a deep to praise. The problem arises when the, ch the children enter the exhibition because for them is only a mount of holes with blood people hanging on a cross. Uh, some people want to turn back uh, and they, they, they cry. These are some pictures from the, from the, the museum. Uh, the whole exhibition has a, a dark environment uh, where there are only crucified Christs. So the problematic is um, how to turn the experience in the museum a positive experience for children, uh, how to create um, a link with, uh, with children, uh, and how to promote uh, membership. The proposed solution is to reverse the, the experience by not taking uh, the children to the Christ exhibition, but uh, bringing one or two Christs to the education service room, where we do the deconstructing uh, of the sculpture. Uh, um, that is to say, we are going to show the final result and the process until that result. And uh, the, ped the pedagogical sweet case is uh, essentially uh, for that. Uh, the sweet case consists on a small collection of the necessary materials on one sculpture for ex exhibitor plates and inf informative um, flyers. The small containers have uh, samples of animal glue, in this case, uh, rabbit skin glue, cowling, um, pigmented glutenant, linseed oil, and an egg. Uh, this is a, a reproduction in which the, the yolk was made from milliput, uh, painting with Kramer pigments agglutinating laropal, and the egg white was made from extal. Uh, the, the sweet case has, has also three different pigment samples, a uh, bowl and gold leaf. The first exhibitor plate uh, has uh, five wood samples, which allow us to show the difference between them concerning the texture, the, the grain, the color, uh, and the way to work uh, with uh, each one. The next plate show, show us the successive preparation layers. Uh, the treatises show that should be applied seven to 12 preparation layers. Uh, we were halfway and then apply 10 preparation layers. Um, we use a rabbit skin glue and cowling. Uh, between layers, we made the uh, leveling and uh, it's not complete, completely perceptible in the, the, the pictures. Uh, in the real sample, uh, we can easily see the, the difference between layers and how soft uh, the surface is becoming. Uh, this plate helps us to explain the importance and the necessary preparatory ground of the sculpture uh, before uh, painting it. The next plate show um, all the stage for uh, gilding and um, was divided into eight parts, which are uh, successively 
only the wood, the wood, uh, the wood. Uh, this is an operation, uh, one preparation layer, all uh, preparation layers, uh, the bowl, water gilding, a modern gilding, and uh, a bowl stud. Uh, by showing this plate, uh, we can explain how to produce each stage in the uh, function and, for instance, the, um, the difference between a, a water gilding and a modern gilding. The last plate show the several uh, several types of decoration uh, that we usually, usually find in the, the sculpture, such as the polychrome itself, um, the punching, the, the graffito, and, and the upholstered. Um, it has also a section with the appliance of all the techniques mentioned before. To make the experience not a um, merely uh, theoretical um, activity, the children have to experience the actions. So there will be uh, several age appropriate possibly uh, activities. Uh, one of them is to give a, a wood square to each child to, to apply the several layers of one polychromy. And uh, in the end, uh, she can bring it home and use it uh, as a magnet. After some time, the child uh, will look at the magnet and won't remember uh, how was made it. Um, so uh, for preventing this to happen, for keeping an active knowledge, um, we, we will also give out informative flyers uh, containing other activities related with this theme. Um, how it said, how, uh, as we said at the beginning, great number of our schools visitors are children from the kindergartens and primary schools. That is to say, children uh, between three and five years old, and six and ten years old. Uh, and it was for those group age that we create the flyers. Uh, but that does not mean there is no, uh, is no possibility to adapt the, the information to higher groups age. Um, therefore, both, both flyers as the same information presented in the single language adapted uh, to target uh, audience and explain the main point of each stage. The sections expose these uh, different aspects what is a sculpture what to care uh, how to care to clean uh, to carry and so on uh, the, the the wood and the curving oh, sorry sorry okay um deciding operation and the preparation uh, explaining what does mean and uh, for what uh, are they useful. Uh, the polychrome that, can, that uh, explain the difference between tempera painting and oil painting. Uh, the gilding uh, that explain the difference between uh, water gilding and modern uh, gilding. In the back of the flyer, there are activities adapted to each age group. As three to five years old children we cannot read or, or, or write yet, uh, we give them draws to, to color. To six to uh, 12 years old group, uh, we present a board game like the game of the goose uh, related with sculpture and the activities in the museum. The flyers make two things possible. The first one is they extend the activity to home by sharing with their relatives uh, what they have learned. Uh, the second one, this is a way to make information last longer because it is a present in the um, physical support with a game to, to play and a drill to color so that the possibility of keeping the flyer increases. Um, in conclusion, uh, deconstructing the sculpture, teaching how to look um, at, it, at it is a, a way to establish a connection and understanding the object uh, that we are watching. If you care and um, if you care what 
we know and like the pedagogical sweet case can be a step to spread the, the word about heritage and it is no doubt um, a tool that optimizes the conservation thank you all for your time and your attention i hope to see you sometime in price museum in sozel thank you Thank you very much, Anna, for this uh, interesting talk about your educational project. So now we arrived at our last Q&A session for this evening. Um, and again, we have a few questions. Let's first start with Mafalda. Mafalda, can you turn on your microphone? Yes. Yeah. Um, I got a question from one of the moderators. Um, she has the printed heart looks slightly slightly bigger than the others, uh, at least on the pictures. Was it difficult to get the measurements right with the different materials? OK, um, with the first four materials, what was easier because I had the original standing in front of me while I was molding um, them. And the 3D printed one was difficult because I was doing it in the computer. And as I said, it was my first time ever using um, those tools. So the part of the measurements, yes, they were more difficult to, to achieve in the, the 3D one. And he got a little bit bigger than the others. Mm -hmm. Can imagine. Um, a second question is that uh, comes from me. So um, on one of your slides, you showed a, a scheme with uh, the evaluation criteria of the different methods you used um, in order to determine which method is the most appropriate uh, for the reconstruction. But I was wondering, could you tell us something about how much time each of these methods uh, required from start to finish? OK, I think the fastest one was the balsa one, um, because it was easier to carve. And um, maybe the paper pulp, the balsit and milliput, the process of modeling was almost about the same. And mm -hmm. the longer one, it was definitely the, the 3D printed one, because as I said, I needed to learn how to work with those tools that I, I've never worked before. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Um, I think that's it for you. So, Angelica, let's switch to you. Yes, thank you. Um, of course, there are also some questions for Anna. Uh, could you please turn on your microphone, Anna? Yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, or there's a, a question here. Did you have a chance to test the flyers uh, with your target audience? And how did they and their teacher react? Do you think this project achieved your goals? Um, uh, they will start to be used next month in my ah, okay. meeting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> I hope uh, is is good uh, a good uh, activity. I don't know yet. Okay, I'm, I'm curious to learn more about it <laughs> once you <laughs> tested it. Um, could you perhaps imagine to make uh, those, these kinds of suitcases for other museums as well? Are they very costly or um, are they kind of easy to produce and kind of straightforward? It's easy to produce, yes. Mm. It is very in interesting interesting uh um, use it in another museums but mine's not good <laughs> okay <laughs> so next year you have to tell us all about your experience okay. with this okay okay <laughs> <laughs> okay okay then i think this brings us to the end of the second Connect session uh, 2023. And um, again, I would like uh, to thank our keynote speaker, Shane Wichnik, um, who hopefully has um, gone back to sleep. 
uh, in Australia. And a big thank you for all the speakers of today, Marta Mandic, Desiree Kose, Mafalda Maria, and Anna Fonseca. So Vincent and me would like to thank our institutes and partners at Connext and all the moderators who were very busy uh, in the background. And um, uh, last but not least, we want to thank you, our audience, for making this event happen. And we very much hope that you had a good time and say bye and good night. Bye.